Welcome to Closer to Truth. I'm speaking with neuroscientist Terence Sainowski, author of the vital, timely new book, Chat GPT and the Future of AI, The Deep Language Revolution. Terry, a foundational theme of your important new book, Chat GPT and the Future of AI, The Deep Language Revolution, is the convergence of neurobiology and AI, which, as you point out, is accelerating both the advances in AI and our understanding of the brain. So what I'd like to do is uh, let's start with your own research uh, over the last decade, specifically since the last time we, we, we talked uh, uh, two decades ago, um, with your research in neural networks, computational neuroscience. And let me just ask you a series of questions. Just give me a very short answer, just a feel, so we get this feel or flavor of your significant contribution. So let me just start. Um, how do computational methods link brains and behavior? So uh, computational models are like bridges. Neuroscience is really good at uh, digging down and finding out how, you know, what are the pieces of the brain and how, how they're, they're interacting. But there's different levels between, uh, say, neurons and networks and systems, and these models bridge those levels. Okay, and, and how do they actually work? Are you imputing quantitative uh, parameters to them? Uh, there are some models that are very detailed that, that actually do um, are based on specific measurements, but then there are more general models. And an example of that is the recent Nobel Prize that was given to John Hopfield uh, for the Hopfield Network, which is very abstract, but it captures some of the dynamics that we think occurs in real brains. Hmm. Um, and uh, these multiple levels, as you study from the, the biophysics of a neuron to the entire systems uh, of how the the basal ganglia inter interact with the uh, with the cortex or the thalamic cortical relations from the thalamus, which was my PhD thesis uh, five decades, six decades ago. Um, how do you how, how does it work at each of these different levels? Well, e each level requires a different kind of model. Uh, you you have to. It has to be based on the level beneath it in terms of the the the, the uh, things that you measure. But then it makes predictions for what to expect uh, that emerge at the next level. And of course, you uh, test the prediction and, and that gives you some feedback. But really, it, it's uh, developing a conceptual framework that you're trying to achieve is a new way of thinking about the measurements in, in a way that gives you uh, the ability to, you know, make progress in terms of understanding how the whole system is organized. Uh, in neurons, uh, how is synaptic strength uh, regulated and ha how do the dendrites, which receive information, uh, integrate uh, synaptic signals? Uh, in the background, I have a pyramidal cell from the cortex. Uh, you can see it's a very fine uh, dendritic structure. Well, well, half my lab is devoted to that question. <laughs> and, and what we're trying to do is develop a very, very detailed model of the synapse. Synapses are not just one number, like a weight in a, a deep learning network. It's, it's a very complex biochemical system that has many different time scales. You know, there, there's fast time scales, which is the electrical signals, but then there's chemical signals that uh, are there to help it, uh, for example, change its strength. And, and, and this has time scales that range from minutes to hours. Wow. Hmm. Uh, and, and also new research showing that the non-neurons, astrocytes, et cetera, might have more to do with the, the function, not just the metabolic requirements. Well, uh, the, the uh, astrocyte is a form of glial cell, and it's always been thought that, well, they're in the background, but it turns out there are as many glial cells as there are neurons in your brain. <laughs> <laughs> so we really have to take them seriously. And you're, you're absolutely right that the, there's a lot of evidence coming out that they they're there as kind of middlemen at the synapses to sort of help things along uh, and integrate information and not, not just nurture, but also, you know, part of that process. Very, very, very important. Yeah. And, and that's a startling uh, way of thinking, which is very different than when I was studying neuroscience. That's right. Uh, you know, uh, we really don't, uh, really, the fact is we really don't yet understand 
in detail what's really going on in the brain. We, we have some hypotheses. We've made progress, but there's a lot more that we have to study and, and, and you know, surprises ahead. Yeah, good. Um, sensory information, we know what that is, and we know where it's represented, and the occipital lobe in the back is visual, and we, we can trace that. But what is the, the deep representation in the cerebral cortex of sensory information in, in terms of the work you've done? Well, th there's been a, a, a revolution in neuroscience uh, within the over the last 10 years because of the brain initiative, Obama's brain initiative. And we now know that what we thought was pure sensory information, say in primary visual cortex, actually half the information there is, is motor information. Hmm. There's to say feedback from the motor cortex to the visual cortex to help the visual cortex predict what's going to happen next. So you, you move your eye, you move your hand, the visual information changes. So it, it, there's a completely new way of looking at uh, sensory information in terms of how it's how it's handled by the different parts of the of the you know the, the auditory the sensory areas. Amazing. Um, how, how about memory? Um, what are the latest theories in memory representations? How are they formed? Uh, how are they consolidated? The, the role of sleep, which we used to think was a waste of time, but we now know is uh, critical, not just for m metabolic uh, success in life, but also for um, the pruning and consolidation of memory. Well, the, the uh, sleep is actually absolutely essential. If you don't sleep, you're in trouble. <laughs> and and uh, you, you, you know, it's not just that you're tired, but your cognitive function will degrade over time. And in fact, uh, can lead to uh, mental disorders. So, so sleep is absolutely essential, especially for the developing brain. And mm -hmm. as you point out, uh, this is not, we now know that it's also essential for being able to uh, take the experiences you've had during the day and integrate them into your large your story cortex uh and, and and it's a dialogue that goes back and forth between a part of the brain called the hippocampus and the uh, cortex while you sleep there there are many stages in sleep and this back and forth discussion that occurs is, is is really important for being able to do that in an efficient way um you've talked about the uh, representational problem in ai let's talk about the representational problem in the brain. How do neural networks, real ones, not artificial ones, learn? I mean, how do they represent information in an invariant sense, making it possible for us to recognize objects, answer questions, understand complex uh, uh, concepts? So, <clears throat> you know, if, if you take, if you go back to the 80s, uh, the, the last century, almost everything we knew about the cortex, and in fact, all the brain was based on recording from one neuron at a time. And yep. that gave us a very narrow view of how the brain works. Fast forward, uh, brain initiative, we can now record from hundreds of thousands of neurons simultaneously from dozens of parts of the brain. And what we've discovered, and this is something that Pat Churchill and I wrote about in our book, The Computational Brain, and that was, that was in the 90s, 92, uh, is that it's, uh, single neurons really give you a, a very uh, the, the, the wrong view. It's just because it's selective for a particular stimulus doesn't mean that it's representing that stimulus by itself. It's the population of neurons. And the large population of neurons has a dynamics. And the dynamics is really what is, is, is supporting a memory, uh, uh, your, your ability to be able to uh, recall things and so forth. So really, uh, we, it's been a revolution in terms of how we think about uh, the, the, the uh, representation and, and how it's learned. How, how do you learn something? It's learned by not just changing you know, inputs to one neuron, but by changing the whole network. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the relationship between neurobiology and AI. What are the commonalities? What are the differences? How can each inform the other? And how are they, as you say, converging? Well, you know, uh, modern AI, as you know, was based on general principles that were derived from brains, massively parallel, highly interconnected units, and learning. That's the magic sauce, right, compared to AI in the last century. So we're on the same page. Uh, that is to say, uh, you know, the, the brain and the uh, large language models now are living in this very same high dimensional space. Now the details are very different, right? And the, you know, in some ways, we, you know, 
<laughs> there's a lot more going on in the brain because it's much more evolved and, and has has a lot more capability. But the fact is now that because we're dealing with the same mathematical structures, we, we can actually uh, exchange uh, insights, information, ideas, and this is really accelerating. I was at a meeting last week at the NIH on something, a new field called neuro AI, which is really exploding right now. It, you know, in other words, there's a, a lot of young people who are getting into this because they see that there's an opportunity here for them to really get in on the ground floor of what's going to happen in the future, which is a, a better understanding of the brain coupled with much better AI. And that's going to happen over the next few decades. Um, you talk about in the book, great book, uh, ChatGPT um, and the future of AI. Um, you talk about uh, the possibility of, of training large language mod modules, not just with the data of the world, but with literal brain data. I think that's what you're saying, which you call large neuro foundational model. Uh, what is that? And is that practical? Well, <clears throat> as we said earlier, the, the, the fact is that you need data. In lots of data in order to be able to generalize and in order to be able to extract, in, uh, uh, you know, things like, for example, invariances, as, as you uh, pointed out, with uh, recognizing an object in any position, any size, anywhere in the visual field. Uh, well, you know, it takes in any data. You can you can give it uh, genetic data. You can, you know, the sequences of amino acids, right? And that that's how we solve the problem of fo protein folding. And, and so why not give it neural data? Now, the, the beauty of neural data, recordings, for example, simultaneous recordings from, uh, as I said, hundreds of thousands of neurons or uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging of humans, uh, activity that's occurring throughout the, the entire brain, <clears throat> that data can be downloaded. And 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 you know the, the, in the early indication, and I've been involved in some of this research, is that the more data, the better it is at being able to extract the, you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 the kind of uh, uh, capabilities that, that uh, the brain is, is capable of. We, we started with recordings, for, whole brain recordings from, for example, fruit flies. And now we can reproduce a lot of their behaviors in, in the computer. Right, that is indistinguishable from and activity patterns that are indistinguishable from the way that the animal actually does it. Like, for example, walking and grooming. These are all things you know that uh, are, are essential behaviors. Now, if we could do that for humans, just think about this: we we can download a human brain into a very very large language model, but in this case, it would be a large brain model that will be able to talk to you. Talk, you know, in other words, you should be able to talk to a person, not through them being there, but through their downloaded brain, which I think would be a miracle. But I think that is possible. A, a miracle or, or, or a nightmare? Uh, it depends on who you're talking to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, would it make a difference if AI were embodied in some way, as it were, in a robotic body as opposed to just existing on specialized CPUs and GPUs, graphic cards, uh, graphic processing units. Uh, would that make a, a difference? Because many of the theories in, um, in uh, human and, and animal consciousness uh, relate to an embodied, this is a new area of conversation, activism and, and embodiment. Uh, is that something being thought about and could that make a difference? Oh, yes. It, this is a really exciting new part, and it is uh, something that in my book I try to emphasize, which is that uh, th this embodiment is really how we evolved. We evolve in the real world with our senses and, and our uh, motor system making decisions. And, and, and these large animals, they don't have a body. Uh, they don't understand, uh, you know, well, I, let's stop for a second. They, we give them images now and, and uh, movies. So they, they do have sensory information in that sense. It's not uh, interactive, but at least they, they know what an image is because you can, you can ask them questions about the image, right? So they must have some understanding of what an image is. However, there's things that we pick up that we're not even aware of by you know, properties of materials, you know, being able to estimate how much they weigh and so forth just by you know, seeing them. 
this is something that uh, you need a body for. And and there's a lot of groups out there right now, uh, you know, ro- who are building robots that have embedded large language models that allow them actually to be much more flexible mm. and and to be able to do some of the things now that I've just discussed because they are ac- having access to real sensory motor data. You draw a parallel between advancing AI technologies and humanity's evolutionary history. Uh, is this a very nice metaphor or is there some deep foundational general systems theory at work? Well, there's no theory here, but uh, we can sort of uh, extrapolate from where we are now. We're at a stage that is like the Wright brothers. We're just off the ground. The first Mm -hmm. flight of the Wright brothers was 10 feet up and 100 feet forward, right? And the most difficult problem for them to solve was how to control where, you know, the plane so that it would go where you want it to go without crashing. Mm. That's where we are with AI. And so we have a long way to go before it's uh, reliable. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it, it's, it's, it is heading in a direction that we can't even imagine. Like, can you have imagined what, what influence the sure. internet has now on our lives? Uh, you know, it's, it's really uh, going to be really uh, revealing what, what, where that will uh, lead us, right? This is amazing. Terry, this has been been terrific. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I love the book. It's a very important book. I recommend it to everyone. Chat GPT and the Future of AI, the Deep Language Revolution. Viewers can watch over a thousand videos and TV episodes on consciousness on the Closer to Truth website and Closer to Truth YouTube channel. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, please like and comment below. You can support Closer to Truth by subscribing. Closer to Truth is now accepting your tax-exempt donations. Please come to closertotruth.com forward slash donate. Thank you very much for supporting us, and thanks for watching.